Well, one could probably do an entire course on the Thirty Years' War. In fact, some professors do entire courses on the Thirty Years' War. Luckily for you, I'm not one of them. I'm going to cover it in uh, about 45 minutes. <laughs> it is a very interesting conflict. In some ways, it was kind of like you took all of the preceding century or so of wars and you threw them all into one. It wasn't necessarily a world war in the way that the wars of the 20th century were. Although then again, there were a few battles in the Spice Islands uh, in South Asia and also in the Atlantic. Th there were elements of a world war to it. Um, the thing that's most confusing about it, though, is how many different belligerents there were. At times, the Ottomans were involved. At times, the French were involved. The English were never really directly involved, nor were the Russians, but just about everyone else in Europe was. You're looking at the Habsburgs, both the Austrian and the Spanish line. You're looking at Sweden and Denmark. You're looking at most of the princes in what is now Germany, or then known again as the Holy Roman Empire. It's kind of like you took all of these conflicts and you rolled them together into one. Um, so what was at stake? You know, and what was it about? Well, again, religion is the easiest answer. The thing that, that sparks it, the thing that sets it off, remember there was kind of a truce. I talked about how you know, Henry IV in France with his policy of toleration, briefly there had been this kind of cooling of tensions, uh, the edict of religious toleration in France, 1598. Uh, there was even kind of a truce in the Spanish-Dutch War. This is kind of fun, actually. If, if you ever get really into European history, you begin to see uh, you know, modern football in a new light, so that uh, like this year's World Cup, you know, who was in the final? Yeah, so it's kind of like they were refighting the 80 years war. <laughs> That's one way of looking at it. The last World Cup final was France against Italy, which you can say they were refighting the Habsburg Valois Wars of like the 1490s and 1500s, or even uh, you know, the Napoleonic Wars when Napoleon you know, invaded and turned most of northern Italy into his own private fiefdom. Um, no, it's always, because it's almost always, unless it's Brazil, it's almost always European powers who are in the final of the World Cup. And so they're always refighting these ancient wars. Well, now the 80 years war. I mean, th this was a fascinating war where it, there was kind of like a, and again, it, it, it basically kind of envelops, it's related to the Thirty Years' War, it's part of it in a way. It predates it, and it ends at the same time, more or less. It's not exactly the same thing, but it's part of the war. Um, what we have here, again, the, the Dutch possessions, remember, included most of what is the modern, the, uh, I'm sorry, the Habsburg possessions included most of the Netherlands, which again is a little strange. Um, after they decided it was too complicated to rule all of these territories, they sort of split it in two, where the Austrian side would more or less handle kind of like Italy and the Mediterranean parts. Um, the Spanish side would handle the Netherlands, Spain, and Holland. Of course, the Dutch were never terribly fond of this, being ruled by this distant power, which as they saw it was not terribly enlightened. In fact, none of these wars would have really been even remotely possible unless you look at the kind of material factor. I think I wrote this up here. Um, again, things that are interrelated. We have a massive inflation which sweeps across the whole Western world and the Islamic world at the same time, along with a massive influx in silver and gold bullion, which comes from those famous Spanish mines in South America. They're obviously not unrelated. You have a massive influx of silver and gold, which leads to a massive inflation, with certain consumer prices uh, multiplying by, I think, a factor of five in about 150 years. Um, that's, that's nothing by modern terms, of course, if you look at like the hyperinflations of the 1920s. But at the time, the thing that made it so devastating was that it was gradual and relentless. Oh, this is why, again, if any of you have read Benim Adam Kermaza, the uh, Pamuk novel, uh, this talk about the inflation, again, it kind of com comes from elsewhere. It's sort of mysterious. They don't really know where it's coming from. Where it was really coming from was the Americas. It was really coming from this massive influx of traffic. They actually had a phrase for it. They called it the Royal Fifth. Basically, the king would just take about a fifth of the volume of all of this silver and gold. In fact, I mean, interestingly, like we think of the English later on as kind of like the ultimate starchy establishment power. But I mean, the English really got started as pirates. You know, basically, they would go and 
not not like Johnny Depp style, but I mean, you know, these kind of silly pirate movies. But that's what they would do. I mean, they would go and they would steal the bullion. You know, they would attack these ships and try to steal it, basically. Uh, the Dutch did this first, and then the English learned it from the Dutch. In fact, one of the episodes in the Thirty Years' War, or the Eighty Years' War, or both of them, I don't know which, it's obviously related to all of them, was when the Dutch actually intercepted a massive uh, silver transport, I think at about 1626 or 1628. Um, but anyway, it's mostly Spain that is benefiting from this, although you might also say it's kind of a double-edged sword or a poison chalice. Spain benefits from this massive influx of silver and gold, but in the end you might say is destroyed by it because it allows Spain to fight just a colossal number of wars, which otherwise Spain could never have fought and which maybe Spain should not have fought. Again, it's confusing. You've got the Habsburgs. I think I wrote up here, yeah, the different Habsburgs. Uh, by the time of the Thirty Years' War, you've got Ferdinand IV, uh, he's on the Spanish throne. You have Ferdinand II, who's on the Habsburg throne of Austria. It's the Austrians that control the Holy Roman Empire, but it's the Spanish, in a way, who are the real power, because the Spanish are the ones with the money, and they're also the ones who provide most of the soldiers, the foot soldiers, the infantry. And you know, some of this, I think, probably even goes back to medieval times in Spain, because of the Reconquista. Uh, the Spanish warriors had developed a certain you know, military system that was very effective. Uh, they had to, because they were fighting against the Muslims, who at the time were more advanced. And so they developed certain techniques and tactics, some involving the pike, some involving uh, greater use of infantry instead of cavalry. And eventually, and they have all these legends about it, uh, El Cid. That's, that's like the great kind of the, the Spanish uh, version of, um, well, anyway, the great Spanish work by Cervantes, kind of, I guess he's Spain's Shakespeare. Anyway, the, the story there, you know, it's all again about this kind of like heroic warrior culture which develops first to expel the Muslims, and then later on, conquering the Americas, but also fighting all of the Habsburg Wars for them. I mean, one theory as to why they eventually lost is that the quality of the soldiers declined. Um, but that said, they did pretty well, considering how many enemies they're fighting. Remember, they're fighting the English at times. They're fighting the French pretty much all the time. Um, they're fighting all of these kind of rebellious German princes. Eventually, they're fighting Denmark. They're fighting Sweden. I know that doesn't sound ter terrifying, right, fighting the Swedes. But that's because in the modern era, Sweden, well, what the Swedes eventually figured out was that the way to get rich in the world was not to fight in wars, but to sell arms to the people who did. That's how Spain got rich in the 20th century. They stayed out of both World War I and World War II, and they sold arms to both sides. So, you know, if you want to get rich, that's usually a better way of doing it. But the Swedes, they weren't that clever yet, so they got deeply involved in the Thirty Years' War, along with all these other powers. So again, one way of looking at it, you have, you know, Sweden, Denmark, the German princes, they're all sort of to the north of Europe, they're all Protestant mostly, and they're fighting against the Habsburgs, who mostly at least come from Southern Europe, which is Catholic. So it's kind of like a civil war between North and South, between the Protestants and the Catholics, kind of. But again, it's not only that, because the mastermind of the Habsburg coalition, the anti-Habsburg coalition, is of course this Frenchman I've mentioned already, the Cardinal Richelieu. That wasn't his, his, his actual born Christian name, but we know him as Richelieu. Um, the one who charmed the regent, the queen mother, Marie de Medici. Uh, actually, the way the story goes, it's kind of funny. He apparently, um, was at, it was actually at the last convening of the Estates General in 1614, which would not meet famously until 1789, the year of the French Revolution. This was when you had the first, second, and third estates, the clergy, the nobility, and then the commoners. And anyway, so he's addressing the meeting of the Estates General. I guess it's 1614. Won't meet again for 175 years, partly because of Richelieu, but also because the French monarchy just decides to go all absolutist and no longer convenient. Anyway, so he's addressing them in, on behalf of the clergy. And usually what you do in this circumstance, you know, you utter the usual kind of pieties, you know, banalities. It's just boring stuff, right? You tell the king, you know, how brilliant he is, and, you know, he's going to carry out, you know, he's kind of like God's region on earth, and et cetera, et cetera, and you are, you know, wonderful. Only the king, he's like 12 years old or something, right? And um, 
Rachel figures, well, look, you know, I could kiss up to the 12-year-old boy, you know, or I could kiss up to the queen mother, you know, who's actually ruling France and who is by now, I think, pushing 50, you know, so that she'll respond particularly well to my compliments. And so he does. He just, he butters her up. He doesn't even look at the king. Like, he just looks right at Marie de Medici and he tells her how wonderful and beautiful and grand and brilliant she is. Um, and so she naturally responds by, you know, basically like working behind the scenes to get him appointed minister or roughly the equivalent of a kind of modern chancellor or prime minister, although the office wasn't really called that. Essentially, he was in charge mostly of foreign policy. Um, and as soon as this happens, he never speaks to her again. <laughs> He's a very clever man. He's a very clever man. But how did Richelieu then come to be the mastermind of the anti-Habsburg coalition? Now, some of it isn't that hard to explain. Remember that France, you know, if you look at the map, France is pretty much surrounded by the Habsburgs, right? And so, if you think about it in commonsensical terms, France inevitably doesn't want to get smushed, right? They don't want to get rolled into the empire. They don't want to be surrounded by it. You know, they don't want to have uh, their trade routes cut off. You know, they don't want to have more territory taken, which will eventually reduce France to an even smaller rump state than it already is. Well, that all kind of makes sense. But then again, remember, some of this reflects our modern assumptions about how statecraft is practiced. The idea of the national interest as being, you know, above all others. Um, that wasn't necessarily, again, the case when it came to something like the Second Roman Empire, the First Roman Empire, or shall we say, the Ottoman Empire, where you know, the interests of the empire and particularly of religion are paramount, right? I mean, you spread the faith. You spread you know, Islam. You spread Christianity. Even in an earlier Christian era, that's what you did. You fought the heathens. You fought the pagans. You spread the faith. You, know, you, you fought on behalf of Christianity. And even more recently, remember, we have all these wars being fought in places like modern Germany over religion. Will it be Protestant? Will it be Catholic? Well, originally, he's not just a Catholic. He's actually a cardinal in the Catholic Church. So he is essentially an agent of the Catholic Church, theoretically taking his orders and his salary from Rome. So that he should be, if you really think about it in terms of his duty, he should be an agent of the Holy Roman Empire which, in its pretensions at least, represents the interests of the great universal Catholic Church. But he doesn't think that way. You know, not only is he cynical enough to butter up the Queen Mother, he's cynical enough to think about French national interest in the coldest terms of what we now call realpolitik. I guess we usually use the German term these days, Bismarck's term, realpolitik. Uh, Richelieu's term was raison d'etat. I guess literally we would translate as reason of state or of the state. Um, the English word realism I don't think completely captures. You, you pro I know you do have a Turkish word for this, but do you, do you use the German term, realpolitik? You do. You use the German term, right. That's, that's probably common because realpolitik, that was the most recent sort of iteration of it. Now, it's not like Richelieu just invented this concept. I mean, obviously, there have always been statesmen who were able to navigate the kind of hostile waters of international affairs in a cold-hearted way, seeing things without, as they called it, rose-colored glasses, seeing things as they are, perceiving your real national interest. What made Richelieu, I think, particularly revolutionary and important was that, again, he was actually an agent of the Catholic Church. I mean, his behavior was literally shocking to a lot of other members of the church. I mean, he was criticized by them. It wasn't just that he started subsidizing the Protestant princes who were fighting against the Catholic coalition. I mean, technically, you have something called the Catholic League and the Evangelical Union. If you want to talk about you know, who was really fighting in the war. But it's probably more useful for our purposes to think about Habsburgs, Austria, Spain against France. Mostly, again, Catholic against Protestant, except that France by now is mostly Catholic. It's not all Catholic. Again, it's a bit confusing because remember Henry IV had converted to Catholicism and then had enacted toleration of Protestants. But Protestants were a small minority in France. As it is today, well, today it's not really Catholic anymore. It's not Catholics and Protestants. It's more like you know, Catholics and atheists today in France, you know, anti-clericals. I mean, 
I can't emphasize enough, though, how much you should pay close attention to French history in this class, because a whole lot of the modern institutions of Kemalist Turkey, of course, drew directly on French models. You know, not only the Enlightenment and kind of Voltaire's critique of the Catholic Church, but in a later era, that of the Third Republic, the anti-clerical tradition, which is to say not the idea of religious liberty or toleration exactly, but more the idea of the suppression of religion by the state. That is, the state working actively to try to prevent the spread of the influence of the church. The state trying to indoctrinate its citizens, or at the very least teach them, a separate loyalty from a loyalty to the church. Um, that was in a later age, though. In this age, France is still mostly Catholic. And you don't have a lot of atheists running around. But you do have Richelieu, who, if not an atheist, is at the very least a very unorthodox sort of Christian. I mean, he formulates this idea, he's trying to justify it. I mean, to himself, he doesn't need to justify it. But to the king, once the king grows up, Louis XIII, he does have to kind of explain what he's doing. You know, so he explains this, well, look, yes, we're Christians. Yes, that's true. Christians aren't supposed to fight, but then again, they always do, right? So Christians aren't supposed to fight, and we certainly shouldn't be fighting against other Christians. Particularly, we shouldn't be fighting against other Christians, the Catholics of our faith, but then on the other hand, states are different from people. People have souls. Souls are immortal. States are not. States are a little bit like, again, this separation between church and state. States are earthly. You know, states are, I think the phrase he used was, was uh, temporal. States live for the here and now. So to look at it crudely, you can say states can do what they want. <laughs> because states are not immortal. The interest of France is the interest of France. Now, I, as a Christian, you know, maybe shouldn't go and commit murder because that might you know, commit my soul to the flames. But as a state, the state is separate from us as individuals. So it can do kind of what it wants. It has a, a separate identity. It is itself and nothing else. So the state must pursue its own interests. And we are serving the state. Again, the state, even some of these terms are anachronistic because it's still mostly called a royaume, or that is a realm, that is, it is the king. You know, France is a kingdom. It wasn't really until the French Revolution people started talking about it as a, as a nation in the way we think about nation states today. But still, France was already discussed in this way. You know, France was France. Austria, to a certain extent, was Austria. Spain was Spain. England was England. It was starting, again, to become more prevalent that people were actually speaking different languages in all these countries, which helped accentuate the differences. The Holy Roman Empire, again, it was this crazy outlier. The Holy Roman Empire was, what, it wasn't, it wasn't Austrian, it wasn't German, it wasn't Spanish. It was kind of confusing. I mean, it was kind of an anachronism, you know, coming from an earlier age. And so Richelieu definitely did not feel, as a man of the times, any need to obey any of these ancient pretenses of the Holy Roman Empire or of the idea of a universal Catholic Church. Well, he obviously did. That's not how he behaved. He started subsidizing first the Protestants who were fighting against the emperor. Uh, he even subsidized the Ottoman Empire. Uh, I mentioned just one of the big episodes of collaboration. I think it was 1642, and the French and the Ottomans actually participated in a joint attack on a Habsburg stronghold in Nice, confusingly, because we know Nice today is part of France, but back then it was not part of France. You know, it was part of the kind of Italian holdings of the Austrian branch of the Habsburg Empire. So Richelieu, he's willing to deal with anybody. I mean, he's supposedly an agent of the Catholic Church, but he's willing to deal with and support the Protestants. He's willing to actually deal with Muslims as well. You know, thus, again, to his enemies, showing that he's a kind of a heretic or an apostate. But to his admirers, he's just showing that he's very effective. I mean, there is something about these revolutionary characters. I, I mentioned Machiavelli up here because he's probably the thinker that would most immediately come to mind. I assume you at least read some Machiavelli in Hegev? Or at least you talked about Machiavelli in Hegev? The prince, right? Prance. I, assume, yeah, I think you, you, do you call it prance in Turkish, I think? Okay, so what, what was the basic idea of the prince? Do you remember? It was advice, right? It was like an advice book. Was there any phrase that you remember? There's one supposedly about fear and love. That's the most famous one. 
It's better to be feared than loved. Yeah. Uh huh. Right, that if you were a ruler, you could give the people what they want all the time, right? You could shower them with gifts and entertainments and balls, you know, tell them nice things, try to be popular. But love, as we all know from our own lives, is fickle, right? You can fall in love, you can also fall out of love. But on the other hand, if you're afraid of a really tall guy with big muscles carrying a gun, you're probably going to be afraid of him so long as he still has big muscles and carries a gun, right? You're not going to suddenly not be afraid of him. You're afraid of him because he's stronger than you. And because, well, okay, and this is maybe more important, probably at some point in the past he has showed willingness to use that force. Now, it's not just bluff. Well, anyway, this is one of many ideas in The Prince. Um, there are, there's some modern scholarship on Machiavelli, which I think is very interesting, which suggests that well, first of all, we think about this book like a lot of great books. It's just this book that just kind of appears. We don't know like where it came from exactly. But in fact, it was a whole genre. You know, all of these kind of aspiring, you know, writer intellectuals would write these books flattering, you know, a local prince like Machiavelli did, basically because they wanted a job or something, you know, more or less. They wanted to be to become a patron. Um, that's what Machiavelli was doing. Only Machiavelli being clever and you know, more brilliant than most of the other ones, he upset the genre. You know, the usual genre, again, it was just pieties, right? It was like, just like Richelieu upset the genre of what you're supposed to say to the king, and he talked to the queen mother instead. What Machiavelli said was, well, all the prince books say that you, know, you are supposed to do this, 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 and this, but you're also supposed to be a good Christian, you know, and so you're supposed to be nice to people, and you know, you're basically supposed to you know, obey the laws and you know, make sure that you don't commit sins against the church. And Machiavelli, much like Richelieu, had just kind of scrapped all that and said, well, forget about that. You, know, you can't do both. I mean, you know, you really think about it. You can't really be an effective ruler in the world and obey the precepts of Christianity. I mean, pe people say this oftentimes in modern America when they say something like, oh, well, George W. Bush claimed to be a Christian in all of this. And yet Christians are supposed to turn the other cheek. You know that phrase, right? You know, if you get punched, you turn the cheek. You don't fight back, right? That supposedly is what a good Christian is supposed to do. I mean, if you kind of read the New Testament literally. Obviously, that's not the way most Christian rulers have behaved. Because rulers have to make difficult decisions. Particularly regarding something like crime or war. You have to make hard decisions that often do lead to loss of life. Machiavelli was clever enough to see that. I mean, it's just unsentimental. Look, you're going to have to make decisions that will go against the precepts of the church. You know, Richelieu took this a little further and he said, look, it's not just that at times you have to violate the precepts of the church, but in fact the precepts of the church should not inform in any way your principles as a ruler. Your loyalty is not to the church or its principles. Your loyalty is to the state. The state and its interest, however conceived. Well, now, what's interesting about this, again, in the context of its time, is that the two Ferdinands, mostly Ferdinand II, the kind of Austrian head of the Habsburg line, sees things very differently. He sees his role as stamping out heresy. In fact, he specifically revoked, I talked about the Edict of Nantes, this edict, it's kind of like, again, a sort of royal decree. Um, his was called the Restitution Edict issued in 1627, which just essentially violated the Peace of Augsburg of 1555. It basically said, it's like reneging on the deal. The idea that princes, he who rules shall decide. No, that no longer is valid, he said. I will decide because I'm the emperor. In other words, he's not going to allow Protestantism in the Holy Roman Empire. And ideally in the rest of Europe as well. I mean, that's what he's fighting for. Um, you know, as he sees it, it's actually his mission, and he would be false to his own calling if he would not stamp out heresy. Now, there was a Spanish version of this, too. It's usually referred to as the Spanish Inquisition. Again, uh, the kind of extreme hard edge, the sword edge of the Counter-Reformation, where they would actually punish and kill many heretics of the church. 
Um, some Jews suffered as well, although the primary opponent of the Counter-Reformation was, of course, Protestants, seen as heretics to the faith. So that in Spain, you had persecution of heretics. And in Central Europe, you had a war, basically, against heretics, a war against the various coalitions and heretics. Um, as Ferdinand II put it at one point, I would rather die than grant any concessions to the sectarians. That's what he called Protestants. That is, they were kind of heretics. You should wage war not for yourself, but for God. In other words, Richelieu is telling the French king, you should fight for yourself and your interests, not of your kingdom. Ferdinand II is saying, look, if I thought that way, I would be a heretic. So I'm fighting for God. I'm fighting for the church. Now, I mean, there's an interesting question here. If you read the Kissinger book, you know, he makes a lot out of all of this. And he says, you know, Richelieu is this revolutionary, and Ferdinand II represents the path not taken. That is, you know, had the empire been unified, had the Spanish and Austrians won, then maybe Europe would have had a universal Christian empire. Kennedy says something similar, although his interest is more in this, this notion of kind of, um, you know, different states and state systems, you know, saying what made Europe unique was just that it couldn't be unified and that that in itself was the important thing, right? That it wasn't like China. It wasn't like the Islamic world. That you had warring, competing states. This is why they improved you know, military technology so dramatically. This is why they learned you know, kind of like how to handle their own affairs, how nation states develop. There's definitely an element of truth in all of this. But I think an interesting question about Ferdinand II and his vision of a universal church stamping out heresy and so forth is just how Western, Western or Christian it really was. You know, was, was it an anomaly? That is, was he unusual? Was he the creature of his time or was Richelieu? Um, not a question that can be answered, really, but an interesting one to think about. You know, was Richelieu part of a longer tradition? You look at Machiavelli and his ideas. You look at later Bismarck. Um, a tradition usually called amoral, which is to say he made no claim that French foreign policy was particularly, you know, morally praiseworthy. It just it was what it was, much like Bismarck would later do. I mean, you know, the, the famous quote of Bismarck, the most famous, is that um, you know, the questions of the day will be decided not by speeches and majority votes, you know, that is by liberals and politicians, but by blood and iron, that is by you know, the battlefield. That there was nothing either good or bad about it, it just was. It's kind of an amoral vision of how to order the world. Well, just how amoral was Richelieu? Now, it's interesting. It wasn't just that he was, again, supporting the Protestants, you know, even supporting the Muslims, on the whole, enemy of my enemy is my friend principle, you know, supporting the enemies of the Habsburgs. That was part of it. But he went a little further. Now, some of this is conjecture. You know, we don't really have evidence. But there's a story that his leading spy, I think I mentioned this, who was another agent of the church. His name was Father Joseph. Um, now, they did have an advantage when you think about this. You know, a little bit like today when you, when you think of intelligence, an advantage the Mossad has always had, you know, the Israeli intelligence, is that so many Jewish refugees came in from Islamic countries since the 1950s that they have all these people who speak the languages, you know, so they can blend in. They look like the people they're, you know, kind of gaining intelligence on. Supposedly, America should have the same advantage, but it doesn't work this way. The CIA is notoriously incompetent. But you think about this, right? France is now governed, or at least some of its most important politicians are themselves members of the Catholic Church. And so they have a sort of right, you might call it, you know, to travel to places like Rome. They have contacts in the church. Um, some of them can even, whether they're actually adopting disguise or costume, Know, could probably make it as far as the court of the Habsburg Emperor himself, such as Father Joseph, at least according to the story. He supposedly wormed his way into the Habsburg court, now, which I suppose was primarily in Vienna, and convinced Ferdinand II to assassinate his own leading general. <laughs> I don't know if this is true, but it is true that Wallenstein, who was kind of the... He was the greatest general on the Spanish side, you know, the one who not only had the loyalty of his men, but who had a great record, he just won battle after battle. Um, he was also great for the Habsburgs in that 
he, you know, he fought war on the cheap, a little bit like um, the soldiers of Napoleon would later do by living off the land, which is to say just by stealing whatever it is they needed to eat or you know, live off of. Um, they started living off the land in Germany. I mean, this is, in fact, from a German perspective, I said there are all these ways of looking at the Thirty Years' War. The main thing about it from a German perspective is that the whole thing was fought in Germany, or like most of it was fought in what is now modern Germany. And the Germans lost about a third of their population. A third. I mean, you think about that. Like a third of the population of Turkey today would be what, like um, 25, 30 million people. Imagine losing that many people in a war. Or in uh, modern America, it would be like America losing 100 million men in a war. That's how much the Germans lost. Partly because, again, the armies, year after year, you know, they keep rampaging across the countryside, you know, stealing the grain and the livestock, um, raping the women, and so on and so forth, just reaping horrible devastation. Now, Wallenstein's troops were not necessarily the worst in this sense. There were other mercenaries who were probably even worse. But they were particularly good at living on the cheap, living off the land. Um, so they weren't that expensive. You know, they didn't cost that much silver and gold bullion um, like some of the other commanders did. Uh, he really did have an effective way of basically running his army. You know, counting for it, keeping the men happy, keeping them paid, keeping them in the field. And then he was assassinated, apparently, by his own emperor. <laughs> and again, as to why, there are all these different theories. But one of them is that Cardinal Richelieu sent Father Joseph to the Habsburg court and convinced the Habsburg emperor to kill his own general. Um, this is, I think, the very definition of what we might call Machiavellian behavior. And it obviously worked pretty well. Now that's it. For the most part, France was content to subsidize, to support the, ha the enemies of the Habsburgs. At a certain point, though, in the mid-30s, about, I think, 1635, this is partly because the Spanish started getting serious about sending more and more troops. The Spanish started threatening France, or at least uh, territories bordering France, in addition to uh, the rest of uh, the, the, the area that is now Germany. The French finally sent their own troops, and they actually did for the last decade or so of the war. They did participate formally in the struggle. So it wasn't just a matter of financial support and subvention. Okay, so you have 30 years war, 80 years war. What's the result of all of it? You know, do wars solve any, you always see these, uh, these bumper stickers, right? War is not the answer, <laughs> right? Well, depends on what the question is, I suppose. Now, wars are terrible. This war absolutely devastated Germany. In fact, a whole lot of the kind of, um, shall we say, impulse for vengeance, or at the very least for a notion of kind of writing the injustice of history of modern Germany dates back to this war. You know, for the Germans, this is, for them, this is like, say, the American Civil War. Um, I suppose in Ottoman terms, you could say it's like the First World War. I mean, for Germans, they still remember this conflict as this devastating, just plague upon their homeland. You know, they lost all these people. They lost a lot of their wealth. It's confusing, again, because Germany didn't exist yet. But you see, that, in a way, was partly the point. I mean, the Holy Roman Empire may not have been holy, nor Roman, nor an empire, but if it was close to anything, that is, if there was any sort of an essence to it, it was probably German. That is, most of the various states composing it, which did pay obeisance to the emperor, were German-speaking. Spain, obviously, was different, um, such that if it had evolved into something like a real empire, like the Habsburgs wanted it to, it would have been German speaking, and it probably would have been something a bit like modern Germany. Uh, the big question of 19th century European diplomacy was what was called Big Germany or Little Germany, which is to say a Germany which would include Austria and Prussia. We haven't even talked about Prussia yet, but we'll get there. Um, or a Germany which would include neither or possibly only Prussia. German-speaking territory in Europe, after all, is fairly large, as the world discovered in the 20th century, particularly after, you know, again, both German powers fought in the First World War, and then Hitler was able to unify German-speaking Europe in the Second World War, you know, with an immense kind of striking power and, of course, wealth base, and you know, in terms of uh, technology and weapons production and so on. Very, very important source of power. 
But it didn't happen for a long time. And the Thirty Years' War is basically the reason why. Because if you look at it from a French perspective, all of this territory, if you look at this map again, the territory sort of in between Austria and the Netherlands. Again, it's confusing. A lot of this that is now modern Germany was then part of the Holy Roman Empire, but remember was not really part of the Habsburg family possessions. You know, they kind of paid obeisance to the Habsburgs. Had it been, then France would have had a major problem on its hands. Which is, of course, exactly what happens in 1871 when Germany, Germany is finally unified. The main thing under risk of the unified Germany is France, as we discovered in both of the world wars. So Richel, in a way, you can almost see him as, as sort of like a prophet. He's sort of like you know, reading the tea leaves about the future. He doesn't want any kind of a unified state on France's eastern borders. And so the settlement that he really masterminds He's no longer in office by this point, but he's still sort of controlling things behind the scenes. In 1648, the Peace of Westphalia, as it's usually called, breaks this thing called the Holy Roman Empire up into about 300 different states. That's a lot. 300 different states which have no capacity, essentially, to unify. Not even for purposes of defensive warfare. Napoleon kind of destroys the thing finally in 1806. You know, it didn't, it, again, it was never really an empire, but it was still this kind of thing that existed geographically, politically. Richelieu made sure to defang it. Richelieu stripped it of any power or threat it might have had. Not least, again, by masterminding the wars that decimated the population, dropping from, what, I guess about 13 million to a little more than 8 million. You know, even as French population is increasing dramatically. So that out of these wars, France emerges essentially as the leading power in Europe. Austria is not completely kind of done yet. Uh, the Spanish, they're pretty much done as a great power. I mean, you remember how I talked about this influx of silver and gold. It was sort of a poison chalice. That is, it allowed Spain to fight all of these wars. But then it allowed Spain to fight all of these wars, which not only destroyed generations of, again, kind of warrior manhood in Spain, but also made the Spanish dependent on this massive influx of inflationary silver and gold, which distorted the Spanish economy, you know, such that it never really developed into a modern economy in the way that the Dutch or the English, to a certain extent, the French economies did. So if you look at winners and losers, Spain definitely lost. They, I mean, it's confusing because Spain keeps fighting with France for another decade after 1648. But by that point, Spain is really exhausted and done as a great power. Austria and that branch of the Habsburgs, they don't lose everything, but they're no longer really a threat to dominate Europe. France is now, by, I think, general understanding of the leading power in Europe, it will soon emerge as the most populous country in Europe in terms of numbers of population. Um, it is also, to some extent, the architect of the settlement known as the Peace of Westphalia, which again, we sometimes date to Westphalia, the modern state system, uh, this notion, again, that temporal authority, the authority of states that are sovereign comes from other states which recognize them. It's not that it was a French idea necessarily, but it grew out of French policy during the Thirty Years' War, a policy which did finally end, at least you know, in most senses, the religious wars such that Protestant countries now accepted the legitimacy of Catholic countries and vice versa. Um, it's not entirely true that religion lost its importance entirely. If you, go, you can go forward to, I think it was 1713, the Peace of Utrecht. This is the first treaty where you no longer even hear talk of this notion of Christendom, or that is, of, of a Christian world. Again, this concept which is taken for granted by most empires, you know, particularly by Orthodox Christianity or Islam, the nearest exemplars of the idea of a kind of uh, pretense of unity between church and state. Westphalia is one major step along that road to the Europe of nation states where religion no longer really plays much of a part, at least in the conduct of international affairs. So you get the rise of secular nation states pursuing their own interests, again, without reference to any kind of external moral 
or spiritual religious authority. And this is seen as legitimate more or less simply because it is. I mean, oddly, by the 18th century, which is one of the worst centuries in Europe in terms of the number of wars, the wars just seem never to end, a lot of people, though, thought there was a kind of system to it. Because the wars, to a certain extent, were limited, because they were all fought over very strictly secular, which is to say non-religious aims. Now, they were all fought about who would control this basin or this territory or this trade concession or this island. Uh, there was no pretense that you were fighting to determine you know, what the religious confessional nature of a state would be. And some people saw in that a kind of principle. They called it the balance of power, the kind of harmony between competing states. Uh, Kissinger has a very good line about that, though. He says that you know, this was confusing the result with the intent. You know? <laughs> people were fighting these wars not because they wanted to be a harmonious balance of power, but because they were trying to gain power, and other people were preventing them from gaining power. Thus, you have the balance of power. The one exception to that rule, a country which we haven't talked about much today, but which will be a big subject next week, is, of course, England, which, because it was separate from the continent, separated by the English Channel, had no other real interest in the continent other than trying to make sure that no one power would dominate the others. In fact, balance of power, if it was ever a policy at all, it was a policy of the British. It wasn't like the French wanted a balance of power. The French wanted to control Europe, just like the Habsburgs had done. Um, but of course, the French, too, in the end, will fail because they will excite a coalition in the era of the Sun King against uh, the threat of French hegemony in Europe. I think we're running towards the end of time, am I correct? Or, Yeah. It looks like we're just about out of time. But please, for uh, Friday's class, please do complete the reading. I would start with the Kennedy again, which gives you the important factual background. Uh, the Kissinger reading is very interesting, though, because it talks about the ideas, the debates between statesmen as to what philosophies should animate their policies. See you Friday.